Father, as we come to this place at this time, we recognize that um, you are indeed a great God, a God of the angel armies. And Heavenly Father, our hearts are heavy in many ways as we come due to things that we have been bombarded with on the news and social media, and sometimes we just don't know which way is up or down, or even what to decide upon right and wrong, uh, but your word stands true, complete, fulfilled in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Father, today we come to you um, expectantly, awaiting a blessing that you would have for us to share together. We do ask, Lord, that you would uh, encourage those of us that are gathered here in this place and those that are gathered around a computer screen or a television watching from on far. We pray for the day that we can all be together and long for that as well. But in the meantime, we are thankful for the technology. We are thankful for the blessings that we have uh, to be able to uh, still worship together in this great country. So, Father, we give now ourselves to you for your glory and honor and pray that you would be pleased today with what we share, what we sing, what we say, what we do. And we commit this to you now in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. So it is so good to be back together a couple of weeks now into it. We are very pleased to be able to do our distance thing here in our sanctuary that allows us to do that. We are um, wanting to fill up our worship response station in the back, so if you'd like to write something down today on that little piece of paper, uh, just leave it in the pew and we'll get those hung up. It's really looking good over there, and if you have a chance, I know we're trying to get you in and out of here quickly, but the responses are phenomenal, and we're going to be leaving those up for you to be able to look at and watch as well. So. I am kind of excited here today because I am about ready to go on a little vacation with my beloved wife who just turned 39 on um, Friday. So there's a, I married her when she was three, so it was okay. Um, but we're going to head down south for a family vacation and then on to, south, to Tennessee, to South Carolina to help ordain my son to the gospel ministry on uh, July the 12th in Anderson, South Carolina. So very excited about that. In the meantime, here, our old pastor, Pastor Craig, is going to be speaking next Sunday. And I know a lot of you are going to be pleased to see him. He's very excited to be here. And uh, Lord willing, Pat can come as well. And then uh, Pastor Steve will actually be coming back from a week's vacation. And he'll be preaching on the 12th. And we're just, again, grateful for a wonderful church family that allows the staff to not only work hard while we're here, but to play hard when we go on vacation. And I'm thankful for so many. Um, so we certainly are um, thankful for the opportunity that we have. You know, we're not passing the offering plate, but so many of you respond with the offering boxes. Uh, I'm, I'm told that a number of people are even just doing it weekly. It look, may be a recurring thing online through our website or even text to give. Um, you can find out more about that on our website. But we're thankful for how God has provided through this entire pandemic. You know, our church is one of the few in the area that did not take the uh, protection money um, as a loan or a grant. We felt that God would provide for us, and he has and continues to. So we are very thankful for that and for your generosity in and through that. So it is a, a joy for me to uh, stand here today as part of a family that's going to worship the Lord. And I'd like to introduce my dad, Bob Renberg, and my sister, Vicki Renberg, to come on up and lead us today in um, some songs. And one of the things we'd like to have you do, if, if you don't sing, you don't have to wear it. But if you're singing, please put your mask on. That just helps respect everybody around you, and we appreciate you doing that for the time being. Uh, it's a important to us. So why don't we uh, all stand for a moment and let's prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. Well, just before we sing the song too, we just saw on, on the internet that uh, your foster son, your son, 
your brother Jim, and uh, from the Okanagan Valley in the state of Washington is watching. I'll sing like Jim. We're going to sing this wonderful song, and it truly is, and I hope you have a wonderful word of life in your own life. Wonderful words of life. All right, if I can have Austin and David come up. We have uh, two graduates that we're gonna honor this morning. Here they come, masks and all, right? Awesome. So we'd like to just honor them uh, as they graduated high school this year. Kind of a different year for graduation a little bit, right? Just a little bit different. Yeah, drive through graduation, right? Oh yeah, we have a few of those. <laughs> yep, okay, and I'm gonna give you guys a mic here. Make sure it's on and not muted. I can't read it, I'm going blind apparently. Do you need help? Just old age. <laughs> no. It's on, here, just push the red button. There we go, there go. <laughs> okay, took me a minute. Technology, <laughs> go ahead, you can talk, there you go. So explain a little bit about your graduation and how it went. My name is Austin. I'm part of the class of 2020 at Moana Shores High School. Our graduation was kind of unpredictable at first because after all we did leave school thinking we would go back for another day, but kind of didn't. Um, we did have a uh, drive-through graduation at the track at the high school. Everything went pretty well and the school's been very great about it and I'm very thankful for that. Awesome. What are your plans for the future, Austin? I'm currently enrolled at Muskegon Community College. I'll be going there for a networking certificate. And I'll be pursuing the career of digital forensics. Awesome, awesome. Let's give Austin a hand. And David, how was your graduation? Uh, I haven't had my graduation yet. Yep. It was supposed to be about a week ago originally, but now it's, I think, July 17th. I don't really know because I'm not going anymore. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I graduated from Spring Lake. I'm going to be going into the Marine Corps July 20th, and that's kind of part of the reason why I'm not going to my graduation. Right. Um, um, I already got my diploma and everything, and just kind of wait to ship out. 
Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you, you guys. Um, I'm gonna just quick pray for them. I always give a little bit of a, just not a speech, but just some advice as a pastor, as a person that has experienced a lot of life. Um, graduated a long, long time ago, not as long ago as Pastor Rob, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I just, but I just wanna encourage you as you move on, you know, you're gonna be faced with a lot of choices. And I say this to little kids during, um, you know, during Mystery Box and stuff, the greatest choice that you guys can make is to put God first in your life, in everything. And there's a verse that has always stuck with me that I learned in ninth grade. And if you know me, I have a lot of life experiences and not good ones because of choices I made growing up and when I was in college and stuff. But my dad made me talk, uh, learn a verse that we actually just studied a couple weeks ago in Colossians as I was going to a basketball camp. And it says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as you're working for the Lord, not for men. And that's so important to keep that focus, to keep that focus of you're working for the Lord. You're doing things for the Lord. He, he died, he rose again for us so we can have, spend eternity with him. And especially in today's society, in today's world, we need to keep that at the forefront of our minds so we can share with others about that, okay? So as you guys go on, as you go to the Marines, as you go to school, remember that. Whatever you're do, doing, you're working for the Lord. And make that be your focus. And make that be your, your, your most profound, uh, when people think of David or think of Austin, they say, man, was he a great follower of Christ and was he a great example? And just remember that as you go on, okay? So I have a gift for you. Um, quick get them for you. And I've done this long enough that they're color coded. <laughs> Mona Shores, Spring Lake, see that? Because <laughs> they are personalized a little bit. So let me just uh, pray for you guys. All right. So dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you so much for who you are. Lord, I thank you so much for David and Austin and just the, the work that they've put in um, to graduate high school. And Lord, it's very different this year. And uh, Lord, as they move on in their life, as they move forward, as they continue to learn and to grow, may, may you become the focus. May you be the absolute focus in their lives. Lord, bless them as they pursue their next endeavors. Lord, may we as a church surround them and be there for them. And may we always just remember them in prayer. And may we reach out to them and may they know that they have a home here and they have a family that loves them and cares for them. Lord, we love you so much. Just be with them, protect them, guide them. May everything they say and do and may everything that we say and do glorify and honor your name. In Christ's name, amen. amen. One more hand for David and Austin. Thanks, guys. All right, this is an easy segue. Uh, if I can have all the little kids that want to come up for Mystery Box, you may come up and grab a carpet shape. Good morning. Awesome. Everybody's looking good. <laughs> that smooth move. Thanks, buddy. Good group today. Everybody's looking fine and dapper and pretty, right? So, all right. Let's see. Let's do this quick. Abby, right? And you're, you are? Danny. Danny. Charlie. Sam, Kaden, what's your name? Kaden, <laughs> Addie, Bretton, what is it? Dallas, Dallas. Zalus, awesome, Zalus, awesome. I like it. it. It's hard for me to hear. It's not just my eyes. <laughs> you can laugh at that. And what's your name, buddy? What is it? 
What's his name? Zickory. Zickory? Zickory? Awesome. You can give me a fist bump, that boy. All right, Brian had the mystery box. Let's get to it. It's a card. Pastor Rob, what's that? Oh, my dream. <laughs> this is sweet. That's a nice... Breton brought it. So this is a deer, a buck, right? It's heavy. Okay. Great, thanks. All right, let's pray. Just kidding. Uh, it is a tough one. But, oh, yeah, we could do that one. And we talked about how God provides already last week, right? So, um, okay, I might go with what Amy said. Yeah, it's pretty easy, right? So, what's that? There's a song to it. As the deer panted for the waters, so long So I just think that Pastor Rob should get up here and sing this song. What do you guys think? Okay, so I, I'm just going to go there. So, you know, we talked about this a little bit last week. God provides, right? So I don't know about you guys, but these masks make me really thirsty. And this is a new mask, and it was provided by Jan Snyder. She had a friend that made it, and she gave the staff one, and it matches well with our theme and, our, and everything else, so I thought I would wear it. It is hot, right? So, and this is all something that we are getting used to. Everybody's getting used to the masks and everything else, right? Well, underneath this mask, I'm probably foaming at the mouth, <laughs> okay? I'm really thirsty, right? Now, do animals drink water, right? We all have to drink water to survive, right? Without water, we would dehydrate and we wouldn't make it very long, right, buddy? You are a cute kid. Um, so we, so there is a verse, okay, that talks about how a deer pants for water, goes to water, and drinks up, right, for, to survive, right, to carry on in life. Okay, so what that verse is saying is, like a deer pants for water, it needs water to sustain its life, and it gets thirsty and it has to have water. And that, in that same sense, we like seek after God. We, we should seek after God. We should, we should look for God in everything we do. Our soul should thirst for God. Like I need a drink so bad right now that I can't wait to go sit at my seat and drink some water. But that's how we should be about God. Like it should just be this, this longing, this need this actually life-sustaining thing that we have to have, right? So you guys know that we live in a world that's pretty broken, right? There's a lot of things happening right now. But the thing that we can be sure about is that God has it. And we saw that kind of in the video, if you saw it, that God is in control, that God has our back. And we need to long for that. We don't wanna long for things that are in the world we want to long for things that are of heaven, right? We want to long for God. So like the deer panted for water, our soul should, should strive and be searching for God and taking God in like a deer drinks water. All right? That's good. Nicely it's about all I can do. Nicely hey, thanks. Thanks for the idea. All right. Let's pray, and then you guys can go back to your seats, all right? Dear Lord, thank you for who you are. Um, I just say that every time because I thank you for who you are. Um, man, would we be so lost without your, your grace and who you are and your word. And Lord, I just pray for these kids as we grow up right now and as they grow up in a world that's really broken and really confused, we know that your sending of your son Jesus and his living his life here for 33 and a half years and then dying on the cross and being raised again. Lord, that is the truth 
that we need to know, and that is the focal point of the Bible and who, who we are in you. And Lord, I just ask that when these kids, as they continue to grow up and they continue to live their lives, Lord, that they would see that and they would focus on that. Lord, thank you um, for who you are. Thank you that we can have hope and peace in a broken world. And Lord, may we not be shy about spreading that hope and peace, especially in today. And that goes for all of us. Lord, thank you. We love you so much. Uh, may you continue to work through every single one of us. In Christ's name, amen. All right, Breton, here's your buck. Not a dollar, just this. All right, so if you guys don't have one and you need one or parents, you want to get one, we do have activity boxes back there for the kids to kind of keep them occupied. Um, if you're sitting around kids, have some grace. They're kids. Um, I know ours is hyper. I don't know where you got that from. <laughs> so, um, love you guys. You can go sit down. The box are going to these two because you're going to be here next week. All right? There you go. Dan and Charlie. All right. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Very well, Steve. Very well done. If some of you watched on Facebook, if you're on Facebook, and you saw an announcement this week of Amy's birthday, it showed all the different places that Amy and her husband, our son Rob, have visited over the years. And one special place was in March of 1992 in Israel, when we as a group traveled around the major sites, but one place specifically that stood out to me as the most important place that I could think of, and that was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we gathered around what was thought of maybe the Cave of Betrayal, and we sang this song that Austin Miles, and Austin, we sang this song for you today, also, Austin Miles in 1912 penned these words to the song we're going to be singing. In a basement in New Jersey where it was no windows, you couldn't see a garden, but God laid on his heart this song in the garden. Stand if you can, we'll sing the three verses of In the Garden by Austin Miles.
thank you to my dad and Vicky for helping out today. We're um, talking about talk today, so I liked how everything has, has fit in for us here with uh, the songs. And um, I don't know if you can recall or not, but growing up, uh, school yards and school playgrounds can be brutal places to, uh, to be a child. And you probably remember the old ditty, say it with me. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. What a joke. That, that is one of the worst phrases I think ever invented because words are crushing and last sometimes much longer than a, a broken or bruised part of the body for sure. And contrary to another cliche, talk is not cheap at all. The power of speech should never be underestimated. Uh, a judge says a few words and a person either ends up going to jail or is set free. A doctor says a few words and a person breaks down in tears or rejoices over that diagnosis. Whether the communication is spoken, whether it's written, there's great power in words. And you know, really, the, the power and the gift of speech comes from God. Um, God spoke this world into existence in six days and rested on the seventh. He spoke it into existence. It's one of the things, actually, when it comes to speech that sets us apart from the rest of the animal world and kingdom. But along with that privilege does come great responsibility. Uh, we know from reading through the book of James that he uses a number of word pictures uh, about the tongue, uh, things like a horse's bridle, a uh, ship, a little rudder on a ship, a poisonous beast, uh, a fruitful tree, a refreshing fountain. And one of the pictures he uses of the tongue is of a raging fire. In fact, he says here in chapter 3 that this little tongue, it's small amongst all its members, but it can set on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. It can do the worst possible things as well as the best. So all of these comparisons teach us that the tongue has the power to direct, the power to destroy, the power to delight such a tiny little muscle with great capacity for doing either good or evil. Jesus, in fact, told the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12, what comes out of your mouth is actually what is going to be found in your heart. In other words, in your mind, in, in your seat of emotions, you are going to be speaking that which is already there. And I think he gave an important spiritual principle to us here. Speech is going to reflect the kind of person that you are and, in fact, is the truest indicator of your spiritual state, where you're at with the Lord. In the Bible, there's a great contrast made between the speech of the flesh and the speech of the new man. Evil, deceit, curses, lies, pride, oppression, boasting, hatred, gossip, flow from the lips of the unsaved and those who are walking in the flesh. Those who have been given a new mind, a new heart in Christ and are walking in the spirit, however, are characterized by edifying speech, that which builds others up, of blessing their enemies, of wisdom and kindness and gentleness and grace and peace and love. All of those things are in contrast together. And so just as it is that a stone dropped into a pond continues to ripple out from that place that it first started, the impact and influence of Christ's life, of his preeminence in our own lives, continues to grow and grow. And eventually it touches all the corners of who we are. Now, we have seen in Colossians chapter 3, as we've been working our way through this little book of Colossians, that 
there is a great importance given to godly living in various areas, our relationships, our homes, our jobs, our church. And now in chapter four, that circle of influence is broadened to touch on the speech of the new man because you see, talk is not cheap. And this morning, as the Holy Spirit directs our attention to some of the rich ways that we can use God's gift of speech to benefit our lives and the lives of others and the lives of the unsaved, I hope that we'll be blessed as we talk about talk today. So turn with me, if you haven't already, to Colossians chapter 3, 4, excuse me, Colossians chapter 4. And we're looking at a portion here. There's, there's several areas that we'll be hitting on, but beginning with verse 2 of Colossians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writing says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving, and at the same time, pray for us also, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your, what? Speech. Speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So if you're jotting some things down on the sermon notes there on the pews here, the first and most important way that we can use our mouths, I'm going to say, is praying for God's will. Praying for God's will, because that's the first thing he says here. Continue steadfastly in prayer. Now, I have to say there is an often overlooked aspect of prayer that Paul hits on here, which is one of perseverance. Uh, the language used here, uh, continue steadfastly, or other translations say things like devote yourselves. It, it speaks here of being courageously persistent, um, holding on to something and not letting go of it. Like you really want it and you're going to keep on doing it. So that's the idea that we have here because too often we only use prayer when we think we need something from God. When we come to that point that we've tried all the other ways to figure it out, we finally call on God and say, okay, God, it's your turn. Please fix this. And a lot of times that becomes our last resort rather than our first focus. And a lot of times as well, our asking God to do something is not saying, thy will be done in this situation. It's saying, do my will in this situation, God, because of course I know what's best for me, and you're going to agree with me on that one, right? So that's unfortunately what happens here to somehow get God moving to do on our behalf. But again and again, we find the instructions to pray on all occasions, Ephesians 6, to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, to be devoted to prayer, Romans 12, and many others. Now, of course, this does not mean that we're always, you know, like talking to ourselves and people are kind of pointing us out saying, what's going on with that person? So it's not just vocalizing prayer, it's a matter of communing with God, of, of in the daily things of life, the normal parts of life, it becomes as natural as breathing is in relating every area of life to him. Now, one of the things that we love and hate about West Michigan is our gorgeous summers and the one of two seasons that we find ourselves in summer because you have winter and summer basically, you have construction and winter. Those are kind of the two things that are, that are synonymous. And so think about this. You know, I've been stuck. Anybody else been stuck in construction this summer yet? Yeah, a few of you have. You know, what, what are the choices we have here when we get stuck in traffic? Fret and fume. I'm going to be late or whatever the situation is. Um, or to pray and have peace. Now, you say, Pastor, what have you been doing when you're stuck in traffic? I must confess, a little bit of both, okay? <laughs> um, so there's a lot of misunderstanding about prayer, and my intention today is not to develop the aspect of prayer about how it works and what it is, uh, or break it down to kind of understand it. I just want to say this morning, I believe in it. 
because God says do it, and so I'm going to be commanded to do it. And the fact is, God enjoys hearing our prayers. He, he loves hearing from his children. But the purpose of my prayers are not to get my will done in heaven. It's to get God's will done on earth in my life. That's the aspect of prayer we often forget about. It's not me telling God what he should be doing or what he should be giving me or how he should be doing it. My prayers, or or we could say my communication with God, is asking what he wants to do for me. What he wants to give to me according to his will. The big things, the little things, everything. And we can be bold in prayer because prayer is not just overcoming God's reluctance to do something in our lives. It's laying hold of his willingness to be at work in our lives. The Apostle John tells us in his first epistle, right after pointing out our security in Christ and the confidence that we can have in him, it extends to his willingness to answer our prayers according to his will. And he said in 1 John chapter 5, I'm writing these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may what? Know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we can all have. Not only know that we have eternal life, but that we ask anything according to his will. Interesting. Not if we ask anything, he'll do it. But if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request we have asked of him. So I'd like to suggest this morning that our prayers should be purposeful, seeking God's will, not ours, and then being willing to accept his design over us. Because here's the deal, beloved. God always answers prayer. Say that with me. God always answers prayer. See, it may not be the answer you're hoping for, but he answered it if he says no, right? It may not be the answer you're wanting to hear from God, but he answered if he says wait for a little bit. Or sometimes, yes, sometimes he says yes. And we like yes as well. Because we think that somehow that's more special when God answers yes to a prayer than when he says no or to wait. But God always answers prayer. And you know what? Sometimes he uses the delay when he says wait to increase our faith and devotion to accomplish his purpose at the right time. And sometimes he says no to us because he knows doing what we asked would be the absolute worst possible thing that he could do for us at that time. But we are so full of ourselves, aren't we? When it comes to talking to God and asking him, thinking that we know even more than he does, so he better do it our way or somehow we're going to be mad at God. I've talked to so many people who say, I just don't want to be a Christian anymore because I asked God to do this or to heal that or fix that or do that or this or how, and he didn't do it. Well... And you dig a little bit deeper, what was the answer? You begin to kind of unpack that. You see, they are mad that God didn't do things their way. So they say, rather than submit to you, the creator of me, I am going to now only listen to me, who is a created being, and tell you, my creator, that you're wrong. Oh. So awful, so awful, but so many people do it. So let's always remember, beloved, that God's delays are not always his denials. And as we continue steadfastly in prayer, as we are watchful and thankful, those are two important words as well. Our hearts are prepared for the answer that God is going to give us. It's going to be yes, it may be no, or it's going to be wait. We find ourselves growing in grace, though, even before the answer comes. Now, this idea of continuing steadfastly, I think this is sometimes where we we forget about it. We we say the prayer and then we just sort of leave it be. Um, There's an old saying that if there's no fire on the altar, the incense cannot rise to God. And there is an old preacher that once said that after we pray, God expects us to get to work. When the farmer prays for the corn to grow in his field, He expects him to say amen with a hoe in his hand. 
right? So when God answers our prayer, when we ask him to do something, it's not just, okay, now I can just let it go. I want to continue to hold on to that. So God is on our side. Amen? Amen. And God always answers prayer. Amen? Amen? So it's so important that we pray for God's will in our prayers. The next important ripple touching our talk has to do with proclaiming God's truth. This is amazing to me. The last part of verse 3 and verse 4. He's praying here or writing here, remember, from prison. That's where he's at. And he's asking that God would open to us a door for the word, the word, the word of God, to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I might make it clear that is how I ought to speak. So, again, amazing to me. If you were imprisoned unjustly, if you were put away in jail for your faith, how would you be praying? Get me out of here, God! Right? That's probably our go-to right there. But Paul doesn't ask for the prison doors to be opened. He didn't do that when he and Silas were praying, were at midnight in the Philippian jail. They just started singing praises to God. And boom, it did happen and the jail doors were opened. But God, he's not praying to God for the doors to be opened of the jail. He's praying that the doors of opportunity, doors of ministry would be opened up to him, even in his current situation. Now, the word door in the New Testament um, doesn't always speak of literal doors. A lot of times it speaks of the idea of an opportunity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul said, I'm going to stay on at Ephesus until the Feast of Pentecost because a wide door of effective work has opened to me. He wrote later to those same Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that he had gone to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for him. So the reason that we're to pray for open doors is because it is the Lord who opens those, those doors and gives us opportunity to walk through them by faith. Now I can say this, beloved. One thing that you can be sure of when you are faithful to proclaim God's truth, you will have persecutions and trials, and people will try to shut you up. Why is Paul in prison? For preaching the mystery of Christ, which he equates with the good news, the gospel, that Jesus Christ is Lord of both Israel and all the world. There's people who did not want to hear this message that he's proclaiming as the apostle of the Gentiles. That Israel and her special place in God's plan and purpose had been set aside for a while. And now God was doing great things through both Jew and Gentile. In fact, he tells us that they are now one in Christ. There's no difference between them. And we know that this new dispensation, that there's no difference between any people, male or female, slave or free, um, Jew or Gentile, we're saved by grace through faith alone, and we are not under the law. So Paul, the apostle, was not deterred from his unique calling and apostleship and that distinct message of grace. If you think back, just turn back to chapter 1. Uh, as he says, beginning with verse 24, he says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister, according to the, the ESV says stewardship, other translations say according to the dispensation from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. What is the mystery that he's in jail for? Christ in you, the hope of glory. That sounds familiar here at uh, Anchor Point Bible Church, Berean Church, right? Domini Baltima, love this verse, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And it goes on and says, Him, Christ, we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. 
Now, the marvel to me of this plea from the prison cell where he is at this point is that he wants God to help him to continue to do the very things that had caused his arrest. He wasn't going to change his ministry and his message. You know, Paul's uh, incarceration, as well as his courage, was actually the inspiration for a guy by the name of John Bunyan. Happened to write a little book that uh, sort of was popular for a while. It was called Pilgrim's Progress. Written also while he was in jail. He was put in jail for preaching illegally. He was told not to do it. He continued to do it. And he was told, actually, that he would be released for, for, for if he promised to stop preaching. That's all the guy had to do. Don't preach anymore, Bunyan, and you're set free. You know what he said? He said, if I am out of prison today, I will preach the gospel again tomorrow by the grace of God. Wow. That is commitment. And, you know, I think of those in more modern times that have been imprisoned and tortured for their faith by communists in China, by the Marxists in Russia, by the socialists in Venezuela, by the Islamic State. Just a few months ago, where was this on the news when they captured and beheaded 11 Christians? You know what their crime was? Being Christians. Where was the news media covering that kind of atrocity? It wasn't there at all. I tell you what, friends, the day that Paul is speaking of is not simply coming for believers in this country. It may already be here. Christianity and Christians are under attack on multiple fronts. Now, make no mistake about it. We are seeing an unprecedented movement of violence and anarchy and hatred under the guise of legitimate, peaceful protest for change, for justice that's important. But it, this movement of anarchy and other names they call themselves, is seeking not only to destroy the Christian foundations of this country and the great men and women upon the backs whom it was built, but Christianity itself. Now, I want to make sure you heard me correctly. Yes, you did. The values and beliefs that come from God's word, that all lives matter from conception to death, come from God's word, from every race, every creed, every color. I mean, why are there not riots for the three-year-old baby who was shot by someone in Chicago, along with the multiple other deaths. You only see selective hypocrisy by those who are trying to make a statement to fundamentally change the foundations of our country. And the fundamental bedrock truth that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation and eternal life for everyone is in fact under attack. So all I wanna say is this, the agenda is clear. All right, just do your homework, friends. That's, that, that's all I want to say. Do your homework. Follow the money. Look for the message. What are these people saying? You know what you're going to find? I'll tell you because I've researched it. You're going to find anti-God, anti-Christian, anti-American, anti-Bible, anti-freedom in the demands and the worldview of those who ascribe to Marxism and socialism and communism and those who would seek to destroy this great American experiment of religious freedom. So important that it becomes the very first amendment in our Constitution. Edmund Burke might be a familiar name to us, said over 200 years ago, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. We should be. We need to be having discussions about racism and social inequities and how to make our country better. Those are valuable and have to continue to happen, but not at the expense of the history of this country. You know what the bigger problem is, from my perspective? The, the more important issue that has been co-opted in this whole discussion is the fact that people are lost and going to hell of all colors, and that should break our hearts. Amen. That should break our hearts because we love them all. And it's nothing new, though. 
The world has always been hostile to God's truth. It still hates God's grace. It still denies God's word. It still despises God's salvation. It still curses God's son. But it cannot stop it. Amen? Amen. It cannot stop it. Satan, though, will do everything he can to quench it, to minimize its power, to stifle the progress, because he knows, above all, that he lost when that veil was rent, when Jesus hung on that cross, when the barrier between God and man was taken away because of what Jesus did on the cross for all people of all colors. Amen. Now, Paul knew what it was like, perhaps more than any other, to endure hardship for God's truth. And I don't know. In 30, now almost 34 years of being a pastor, I've never seen a time that I was perhaps more distraught about what I would say from the pulpit than I am today. Because this is being beamed out all over the world. And is there a day coming that we, like the Apostle Paul, like the early Christians in Rome, were burned at the stake, were had their bodies lit on fire to light the night for the Roman Colosseum? Is the day coming that we're told, you can't preach from this book or you're going to end up in jail. You can't call on the name of Jesus Christ or you're going to end up dead. You don't think it can happen here? Okay, China, Russia, Nicaragua, Venezuela, North Korea, Nazi Germany. Do I need to go on? It happens when good people do nothing and don't stand up for the truth and who they are in Christ and let people know the message of grace and love and salvation is found in the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. So my question is, will we pray together and on our own for boldness, for clearness in sharing our faith? I wonder if the time in fact isn't short. And Satan knows it. And we are seeing his fury and anger unleashed on believers as never before. It's not enough to just live the Christian life. Kind of hide in our hollows and uh, show up at church for a little bit of time and feel good about it going on. We need to speak the truth as well. Trusting God to work through his word. To reap the harvest that he's prepared. See, you never need to be afraid to... Speak the truth in love. The truth will always set you free. But even in the religious realm, and I believe this is primarily the area that Paul is focused on here in this portion, there's a lot of Christians who are in bondage to traditions and rituals, thinking that it's the things they're doing as Christians that are going to make them okay to get into heaven. That's somehow going to put them on a level that they don't have to worry about things because they've checked all the boxes. That's exactly what's happening in Colossae, and Paul is concerned for all people. So let us pray with open hearts, open minds, to, to understand God better and more fully as we allow his word to, to be what shapes our theology, not the news. Let's let this book tell us what is right and wrong and what we should believe and who we should believe and how we should believe. It should never come from others outside of those speaking the truth of God's word. Amen. We need to speak that truth in love, friends, even when it's boldly and clearly and trust the Holy Spirit to use it. Okay, can I get an amen? amen. All right. Finally, we see the importance of using our speech in presenting God's grace. Where am I here? Can I go back? There we go. Presenting God's grace. <clears throat> Five and six. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Wait a minute. You mean there's division in the Bible? There's, there's not equality among all in the Bible? No, there's not. There's those who are outside the family of God, those who are outside the realm of God's salvation because they have not taken the step of faith to put their trust in Jesus Christ alone. So there is inequities, if you would, in the scriptures, and there always will be, because the difference is between light and dark, between evil and good, between heaven and hell, between Satan and Christ. There's always going to be a dividing line there. 
But we need to make sure we understand that what believers are lends credence to what we say. And it says here to make sure that we're walking in wisdom towards those who aren't in Christ, those who are outside that realm. Now, please, let me say this. This should never be translated for any of us as believers to, to have some kind of sanctified superiority complex. You know, we don't belong to a, a social club here at Anchor Point Bible Church. We belong to a family that is growing and we want to continue to grow because we have the message that changes people's lives. Not just in this world, but for eternity. Amen? Amen? So everything we do in this place is to impact our world. To bring more and more into the family of God. Prepared for eternity that all of us are going to face. So how does God say we should act and live and talk right now? Well, there's several instructions. He says, walk in wisdom. The idea here is that you would conduct the wisdom of life. What does our life say about Jesus? If, if an unsaved person came into your home, what would they think about the difference Jesus makes in your life? What would they see? What would they hear? Whether we like it or not. <laughs> the people who know you call yourself a Christian are watching you and me very closely. They're very critical as well. And they often catch us in hypocrisy and when we stumble and fall. So we need to be really careful that we don't quickly just say, well, but I'm forgiven. Because that to them, that doesn't cut it. So we have to be willing to say, I'm forgiven and by God's grace, I'm going to do better next time in giving glory to God and not stumbling or sinning in this area. Because the world is very quick to point out our failures. And we just have to be careful that we don't lose our ability to witness to those who see us in our humanness. I remember when I first gave my life to the Lord, rededicated my life back in 1984. I worked at a grocery store and I was really on fire for sharing the gospel, teaching Bible studies. And I was working at, at uh, the Safeway store and I uh, kind of got caught up uh, during the break with the rest of the guys and the gals in the back and they were joking and stuff. And I told an off color joke. And everybody kind of laughed, and then we went our separate ways. The guy from the meat department, who was just a little older than me, came up to me after that, pointed his finger in my face. He said, I knew it, Remberg. I knew this Christian stuff was going to stop. Because what you said in there is not what a Christian should have said. And I was just struck to the quick. I, I literally cried. God, help me have another opportunity to to adjust that mistake and to let truth come out of my mouth rather than what he was now holding on to as a reason he wouldn't become a Christian because Renberg, who talked about Christ, also had his mind in the gutter for that joke. This is a tough one. Taught me a lot there. I think if we ask the question, how do we walk wisely? We have to look at our context. What have we been seeing? We're seeing in our homes with our husbands, with our wives, with our children. We've seen our work lives, how we live, uh, uh, how, we, how we are working. And I think, and I would suggest to you, this also means how we pay our bills, how we keep our promises. You know, the golden rule is still a really good one, right? It means we use our time wisely. Uh, it means that we're, we're not putting off until tomorrow what we can do today, especially in our relationships. Uh, beloved, just keep a short list when it comes to your relationships and make things right as much as it depends on you. You know, Moses prayed in Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. The doors of opportunity that God gives us are only open for a moment. Life is short and every day more people die without Christ. The return of our Lord, I'm telling you, it's going to be an exciting thing. And I've seen, you know, a lot of people talking about this, being caught up to meet Christ in the air. It could happen at any moment. Paul thought it could happen back in his day. Are we any closer to that after 2,000 years? I would suggest absolutely we are. And the time is urgent. In fact, the Apostle Paul affirmed this in Romans chapter 13. He said, wake up! Salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. So as we live like a believer, God will open doors for us to share our faith. And that is why this verse is so important. We need to know how to witness for the Lord. You say, oh, okay, pastor, you had me right up until then. 
You want me to actually tell somebody about Jesus? I'm sorry, that's for the professionals. That's for, for everybody else. I can't do it. Yes, you can, and you're expected to do it. That you would be able to know how you give an answer to each person because they're gonna ask the questions. Now, it might help to say, well, I know somebody that can talk with us about it, but don't just blow that off and say, oh, I can't do that and lose that opportunity. God will give you, even if it's a, if it's a children's song or something that, that he brings to mind, uh, verses like the Romans Road, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Take them to scripture. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yeah? Yeah? How about the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yeah? Okay, God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And finally, Romans 10. Everyone who confesses with their mouth and believes in their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord will be saved. Wouldn't you like to do that? Wouldn't you like to know for sure that you have peace with God and that your eternity is set now in heaven because of what he did for you on the cross? Very simple. All of us need to make sure that we are sharing God's word. And it says here it needs to be our speech seasoned with salt. Now, I think some believers translate this um, as uh, let your speech be salty, right? <laughs> um, they just kind of want to sting people with their sarcastic jabs and their their uh, negative outlook. And, and you can see this in some people who, who just... They find something wrong with everything and everybody. It's just negativity all the way around. That is not a door, beloved, that will open up for sharing God's grace and love with others. People don't want to be around people like that. All right? We're not called to curse the darkness. We're not called to rail at the darkness, to, to spit at it in disdain. You know, I did a little experiment. I, went, I tried to find the darkest room in my house, which happened to be our um, bedroom closet, our master closet. No lights, no outside light coming in, and it was dark in there, okay? And I yelled at the top of my lungs, get out of here, darkness! Didn't work. It didn't work. You see, it's not until light is introduced into darkness that anything changes. So if you think you're just needing to step back and hold back and, because the darkness is all around, let me tell you what, friends. You need to illuminate the love of Christ and the peace of Christ with the people that are around us, the world in which we see, the people that are reading your social posts on Facebook and Instagram. How are you using your speech? How are you using your platform to speak truth and love and peace and joy and harmony and unity into a situation that Satan has fractured and divided and is seeking to pit one against another until we destroy ourselves? Something to think about for me and all of us. Grace in our speech presupposes grace in our hearts. As Jesus said it the best, the mouth speaks out of what comes from the heart. So salty speech, we laugh at it, but actually in classical Greek, spoke of joyful and witty talk, interesting to those that were hearing. We need to speak. We need to use our words wisely. Jesus met people where they're at speaking to their interests, their needs. We don't need to be afraid to be part of an unbeliever's life because how else are they gonna see the difference that Jesus makes in living? Above all, friends, speak the truth in love, watching what we say and how we say it. So, talk is not cheap, amen? It's God's gift to us. We need to use it for his glory and purpose. We need to pray for God's will. We want to proclaim God's truth, and we need to present God's grace. Our talk and our walk need to be in harmony with each other. So pay attention to this little thing right here in your mouth, okay? Right there. It can do a lot of damage if you're not careful. But it can be the most beautiful thing in the world in speaking into people's lives to bring glory to God through his son, Jesus Christ, who is the answer for all the chaos that we see in the world today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
I pray that this week, me, we can't go back, we can't change. We might be able to erase a, you know, a, a post or, or edit something that we've said that just wasn't good or appropriate. But Lord, help us going forward from here to bless you with the fruit of our lips, the, the writing from our minds, um, to help someone with kind and grace-filled words this week. Lord, help us to be those who speak the wonderful words of life into those around us, into our world, for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Would you stand as we sing a closing song, Wonderful Words of Life. said amen. and amen grace and peace be with you have a wonderful week in the lord if you want to dismiss by row and enjoy each other's company outside wonderful amen.